Okay guys, here's our next segment on our video series for chemical reactions, uh, working with double displacement reactions. This is our fifth reaction type, and it's actually our last reaction type uh, in the unit. So what I'd like to do to start off is go to the board and kind of review a little bit of what we've done to lead us into this reaction type, okay? So if we look up here on the board, we covered combustion reactions uh, just recently. There are very spe special type of reaction dealing with oxygen, making carbon dioxide, and water. To start the unit, we took two single elements, put them together to make a compound in combination reactions. We took a compound, split it apart in a decomposition reaction. And then we took a single element plus a compound, and we had them trade partners, or had the A and C, if they're both metals, switch places in single displacement reactions. So if we look, we've done Put them together, take them apart, switch partners. So that's it, right? That's all we can do. Actually, there's one more. We haven't yet to see what would happen if we had two, comp two compounds. How do they interact with each other? So we have a compound plus a compound. The reality is this reaction isn't any more challenging than this one. Um, it actually does the exact same thing. It just looks a little different because there's an additional anion here, okay? So this is our next reaction type, or our double displacement reaction type, where we have two compounds together to form new things. Now, just like up here, where you had the metal trying to replace the other metal or switch place there, same thing happens here. So in this case, because they're both in compounds, it doesn't matter which one's higher on the activity series. There's a different way to determine if this reaction will happen or not. And we actually determine that once we make our products over here. So C is written first. A is written first. They're both our metals. So what they'll do is they just switch places. So C and A flip. C now bonds to B. A now bonds to D. That's it. So we end up getting A and D together, and C and B together, okay? Now, I wrote it like this here. You could also write CB plus AD. It doesn't matter which one. It's like saying 5 plus 2 or 2 plus 5. It means the same thing, okay? But you have to put the C first and the A first because they're your metals, and they're written first in the, in the reaction, okay? So single displacement and double displacement do the same mechanism where they just take the similar element, if it's a metal to a metal, metal to a metal, and they just change places. That's all they really do. Okay. Now, when we take a look at double displacement, we can have a little bit of a problem with this one because you get some complexity in your, in your compounds. So let's, let's go back to the screen and look at our examples now. So if we look, we have aluminum chloride in solution reacting with sodium phosphate in solution. And they're going to make aluminum phosphate and sodium chloride. One's in solution, one ends up being a solid. Okay. Now how do I know what changes places with what? Because I have ALCL and NAPO4. It's a little bit more complex than just A, B, C's, and D's. So again, identify your metal, identify your non-metals, and just keep them separate as you work. So aluminum's a metal, sodium's a metal, so they're going to trade places. Chlorine's a non-metal. And phosphate, even though it's a polyatomic ion, it is non-metals. So it acts as a single thing here. So the key is, don't try to break the phosphate apart. Keep it together. You just have it have a new partner at the end. So the sodium and aluminum trade places. So the aluminum now bonds to phosphate. The sodium now bonds to chlorine. Okay? Now, double displacement reactions don't always work. There are cases where you put two solutions together and nothing happens. Okay, so you notice how double displacement typically is run in solution, very much like single displacement is. So usually you have these things dissolved in water. Now, for the reaction to happen, one of three things must be produced. You either need to make a gas, you need to make water, or a precipitate, which is a solid, basically. Okay, when you make a gas, those are really obvious ones because you're going to make carbon dioxide gas or you're going to make carbon monoxide gas, or some sort of other gas that's pretty common to you guys, and you guys would know what that one is. Um, this is very rare to happen. 
Producing water only happens in a very specific reaction. That's when you neutralize an acid and a base together. So the only way you're going to make water is if one of your compounds to start is an acid, which we can identify because we know acids always start with hydrogen. Your base, your anion, will always be hydroxide. So if you have a hydrogen plus a hydroxide, you know you're making water for that one. Again, it happens, but only specifically with neutralizations. All right? The bottom one, this is the one that we're going to focus on. So circle this one in your notes. This is the most common situation. This is your classic double displacement type of reaction, is when you produce that precipitate. Now the hard thing is, how do you know that this is a solid and doesn't stay in solution? How do you know that this stayed in solution and didn't become a solid? Okay, so you had to have some sort of way to do that or some sort of rules to do that. So to do that, we need to have a table. So if you would please, find your periodic table, flip it over. On the back side, we have a chart called solubility rules. And we'll take a look at that. Okay, so on the back side of your periodic table, you should have your activity series over here, which we only look at for single displacement. So if you have it written down here, maybe on the side or something here, write only for single displacement. Because I don't want you looking at this when we're doing double displacement stuff. Okay? For double displacement, we look at solubility. So maybe up here or someplace you can write double displacement. So you remember when you write, look at which one. So here's our rules. Now to read this table, it's kind of broken into four different pieces or quadrants. You have your upper left that is soluble ionic compounds. And then below that in the same column is insoluble. Now insoluble means not soluble. So that's not something you're familiar with. Put a little not by it. So not soluble compounds. Remember soluble means dissolved in water. So this is dissolved in water, which we symbolize by saying aqueous. This is not dissolved in water, which we symbolize by saying solid. The way the table works is these are your typical soluble anions or negative ions, okay? Um, these are your typical insoluble ones. So typically, if someone says, hey, I reacted this with sulfate, will that dissolve in water? Normally, the answer is yes. Or if I have nitrate, will that dissolve in water? Normally, the answer is yes. These are typically soluble. If someone talks about phosphate, as a chemist, someone who's been trained in chemistry, as soon as I hear the word phosphate, I'm thinking that's not going to dissolve in water. There's no way. Because phosphates typically do not dissolve in water. Okay? Now, there are some exceptions, and the exceptions are listed on the right-hand column. Okay? So, nitrate is soluble. Is there any time it won't be? No. Anything you put with nitrate, you can put aluminum nitrate, lead nitrate, sodium nitrate, calcium nitrate. Any cation with nitrate will still be soluble. Same thing for acetate and chlorate. So these things always make soluble compounds. These are not compounds yet. You need to put a cation or a metal with them. Now, chloride typically is. But if you put silver metal with chlorine to make silver chloride, not soluble. Silver chloride is solid in water. Silver bromide, silver iodide, same thing. Or mercury or lead. Notice how these three exceptions are very common. Now, a sulfate, it's strontium, barium, mercury, and lead are your exceptions there. So silver sulfate would be soluble, but not barium sulfate. That would not be soluble, okay, as you look at how you read the table. Go down to the bottom half of the chart. Your things that are insoluble, they have some exceptions also. So normally, carbonate is solid. It doesn't dissolve in water very well. Most carbonates, most chalky kind of things don't dissolve in water well. All right. However, if you put it with an alkali metal or the ammonium ion, it will dissolve. Most oxygen, most oxides are not soluble in water. Unless you put calcium oxide, strontium oxide, ammonium oxide, these are your exceptions to that. So the best way to read the table is identify your anion. <clears throat> that kind of tells you which, if you're on the top part or the bottom part of the table. So let's say your anion was hydroxide. So you're thinking this is going to be a solid. Anytime you see hydroxide, it's probably going to be a solid. Unless, make sure you check to the right your exceptions. If you had calcium with hydroxide, then it becomes aqueous. Okay? So that's kind of how you read the table. And we'll do an example just to show you to kind of work through the table also. All right? So let's go back to the keynote. And let's take a look. Um, we have our example here. 
this little paragraph down here talks about what happens if you don't have a soluble or insoluble substance. So here's your two choices. If everything on the right-hand side, so if both products are soluble, you get a no reaction. If one of your products is insoluble, like our case up here, we get a reaction. The reaction does happen. Okay. So let's keep our soluble rule, solubility rules table up, and let's do some examples to work this out. Okay, so the first example we're going to do, we're going to take magnesium bromide, and magnesium has a 2 plus charge, bromine has a 1 minus charge, so I need two bromines to make that work. And we're going to have that in solution, so magnesium bromide in solution, then I'm going to react that with, all oh, this use potassium nitrate. Potassium is a 1 plus, nitrate is a 1 minus, so that is a 1 to 1 ratio. And potassium nitrate also will be in solution. Put the two together, and we first thing we want to do is we want to switch partners, okay? So potassium and magnesium, they switch partners, okay? So it's kind of like a square dance. Have you ever been to a square dance if you live out in the country? Uh, you know, you swing your partner around and around, that kind of stuff. So these two dance together, and then they just switch partners and they dance with somebody else. Okay, so that's kind of double displacement. Um, when they switch partners, I'm going to get potassium bromide. And again, I have to check my charges because I'm not going to carry this two over just because it was there. It may not be here. So let's see. Potassium is a 1 plus. Bromine is a 1 minus. So a 1 plus, 1 minus. I don't need to have the two there, so I can't put it in. I haven't checked yet to see if potassium bromide is soluble or not, so we'll do that here in a minute. And I'm going to make magnesium nitrate. Magnesium is still that 2 plus. Nitrate is still a 1 minus. So I need to have two nitrates to make this work. And again, i got to check that solubility chart to make see if one of these two things forms a solid, okay? For this reaction to happen, one of these two things here, not both, just one of them, needs to be a solid, okay? If they're both AQs, no reaction. So let's go to the chart and see what it means to us. So first one, we have bromides. So go to our chart, find bromide. Okay, bromide typically is aqueous. So usually we're going to think, okay, this is going to be aqueous substance. Now we do have some exceptions. So silver bromide, mercury bromide, or lead bromide. Well, bromide in this case is with potassium. So it doesn't have the exception. So this will be aqueous. And then next we go to is our nitrates. Okay, so we go over to nitrates, thinking, yep, nitrates are going to be aqueous. And it has no exceptions. Okay, that's a great one to remember. Nitrates always soluble with everything. So this one also, because there's no exceptions, is going to be aqueous. So we have an aqueous and an aqueous. Neither of them became solid. So this reaction will not happen. Okay? This is kind of like if you took sugar water and salt water and poured them together and said, look, chemistry. I'd like, no, you just made salty tasting sugar water. Okay? No chemistry here. All I did is have magnesium bromide in solution, potassium nitrate in solution, and all that's happening is these two solutions are floating around next to each other. Nothing changes partners. This does not happen. No change. So instead of doing all this, you would just say no reaction. Okay? You don't even need to balance it. don't need to do anything. It doesn't happen. No reaction. Okay? Because this does not do any chemistry. So that's our first example. Let's do a second one. Okay, so for our second example, we're going to take uh, calcium chlorate. Calcium is a 2 plus. Chlorate is a 1 minus, so I need two of them. Chlorates are always soluble, so I know this is aqueous. Plus, uh, let's use uh, lithium 
carbonate. Lithium's a one plus, carbonate's a two minus, so I need two of those. Carbonates don't tend to be very soluble, but with the alkali metal it is, so that one is also soluble. And then I'm going to produce, again, just switching partners, lithium chlorate. And lithium is a 1 plus, chlorate is a 1 minus, so no subscripts are needed on either one of these. Plus calcium carbonate chalk. Calcium is a 2 plus, carbonate is a 2 minus. I don't need subscripts here. And we're set up. Okay, so now our next step is I know my subscripts are right. Let's check to see if this happens or not. So let's start with lithium chlorate. Go to the chart. Here's chlorates. Chlorates are aqueous. So are there exceptions? Nope. So it's going to stay aqueous. So lithium chlor chlorate is in solution. This does not do any chemistry. This Nothing really happens by making this. Okay. The calcium carbonate, let's check that one. So carbonates tend to be solid. Um, so it might be our solid here. Let's check. Alkali metals. Well, calcium is an alkaline earth metal, so it's not an alkaline metal. It doesn't count. And we don't have calcium listed here. So calcium carbonate is not an exception, so it stays solid whenever you put it in solution. So here is our solid. So this is our precipitate. And this is what drives the reaction to happen, okay? So by forming the solid, the chemistry actually works because this thing falls out of solution. It creates this solid kind of powdery, kind of cloudy stuff in the solution, okay? So we create a precipitate. This does happen. So our last step is to make sure we balance the equation now. Um, let's see. Well, we have two chlorates and two lithiums, so I better put a two here. One calcium, one calcium. One carbonate, one carbonate, and I'm balanced with that too right there. Okay, so this reaction is now done. Uh, we don't need to have these arrows here. We don't need to have the charges in our final answer. And we don't need to have that. However, you do need to have the states of matter identified because this is what tells us the reaction does happen because we made that solid. Okay, so two examples, one that works, one that does not work for our double displacement reactions. Okay guys, that is it for today. Um, please go to the worksheet now, worksheet four, and go ahead and identify your double displacement ones so we can practice those in class also. Thank you.